The second article is Article 73, the extent of executive power of a union. It says, again, subject to the provisions of this constitution, the executive power of the union shall extend, mind you, to the matters with respect to which parliament has power to make laws. This particular clause actually restricts the power of the union executive. It says that it will exercise only such power on which the union parliament has authority to make laws. It can't go beyond that. But this is the interpreted to mean that wherever the parliament has power to make a law, the union can act in its executive capacity. Now, if this is the interpretation, then it will only mean that we need not have a parliament, we need not make any laws. Parliament does not or uh, is not it is not necessary for the parliament to make any law. All that is necessary is to enumerate the subjects on which the parliament can make law and then a union can act, I mean the executive can act in its executive power on those very subjects. That interpretation you will all agree is devoid of any meaning. And if this is the interpretation, then why do we have the provision for issuing ordinances when parliament is not in session? It is precisely because the executive cannot act without a law that it is necessary to issue ordinances when the parliament is not sitting. Otherwise, you go to the parliament and get the law enacted. This is one. Secondly, another clause says that the executive power of the union shall extend to the exercise of such rights, authority, and jurisdiction as are exercisable by the government of India by virtue of any treaty or agreement. But this presumes that the treaty or agreement is approved of by the parliament. The parliament is supreme as far as the legislation is concerned. And therefore, under Article 73, there is no power to the union executive to act without the provision of any law and the law has to be enacted by the parliament. Article 253 is more specific. It says, Notwithstanding anything in the foregoing provisions of this chapter, Parliament has power to make any law for the whole or any part of the territory of India for implementing any treaty, agreement or convention with any other country or countries or any decision made at any international conference association or other body. In spite of this provision, clear provision in the constitution that every action of the executive has to be supported by law and in spite of these provisions in the various articles of the constitution, some people try to read an implied power in favor of the executive to act 
without the authority of the parliament or its legislation. Now look at the entries, union list entries. There are only three entries on the subject. The first entry on which the union parliament has to make law, can make law, not has to make law, can make law, and the union parliament alone is union list entry number six. It says atomic energy and mineral resources necessary for its production. So this entry gives power to the union parliament to make legislation on the subject. It does not give power to the union executive to exercise this power. The union list contains subjects on which the parliament has power to make law. And here it is specifically stated and not atomic energy and mineral resources necessary for its production. Next is 13. Participation in international conferences, associations and other bodies and implementing of decisions made there at. That is the province of the legislation by the parliament. The next is entering into treaties. Entry, entering into treaties and agreements with foreign countries and implementing of treaties, agreements and conventions with foreign countries. That is the subject matter of legislation given by the constitution only to the union parliament. This is not within the jurisdiction of the executive power of the union. Now these are the articles, these are the entries in the union list which give express power to the parliament to make legislation. Where do we read the implied power? As I said in the beginning, we have a written constitution. We don't have an unwritten constitution where you can infer implied power by conventions, the traditions and practices. We forget that after the constitution was implemented, put into force, it is not the British regime, British conventions, British traditions, which govern the conduct of affairs in this country. This being the position, any action by the union executive without consulting the parliament is not only unconstitutional but is also undemocratic. How can the union executive usurp the power of the people and the parliament. An act in its own right disregarding the parliament, bypassing the parliament. And now as it appears, it is disregarding even the majority opinion in the parliament. Now in this connection I invite your attention to the recommendations made by the review committee on the constitution, which was established when BJP government was in power under the chairmanship of the ex Chief Justice of India, Mr. Venkatel. This commission against the background of a spate of agreements and treaties which the government was entering into with foreign countries and foreign organizations, recommended that the constitution should be amended. 